welcome to this, another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and today we're talking with Matthew Duclos, the resident uh, lens technician and lens geek over at Duclos Lenses, uh, to kick off Lens Month. Um, this is something I had an idea for uh, actually three months ago and recorded all these interviews, so <laughs> the information or what I say might be a little out of date. Certainly, um, you know, it always ends up happening where you, you learn something and then you wish you could go back and ask more informed questions but um you know i figured uh why not have i'm I'm friends with a few lens guys uh you know matthew duclos uh today's episode good friends acquaintances with him um alex nelson of zero optics coming up we got jay holbin great get for me um you know just plenty of people who could lend their expertise and talk to me about lenses which you know i know how to use the lenses i know what they are but I, i don't really know the um, anything specific about them. You know, I just know I like the look. I know how to make sure it's sharp or not sharp. Um, I know how to expose an image, but I don't really know the internal mechanics or anything about it. So tried to dig as deep as I could uh, with all of these guests for the month of July. So um, hopefully you find that enjoyable. It'll definitely be a nerdier uh, series of podcasts. But, um, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably bit of a nerd anyway so um you know as matthew is a friend of mine the conversation did go long so i just kind of had to pick a (laughs) point to cut it off um again privilege of being the host i get to talk to these people for as long as i can um but yeah so uh i think you'll really enjoy this one matthew is uh an absolute i I almost said fucking wealth of knowledge again gotta stop saying that but it's true um yeah so uh here's my conversation with matthew duclos let me ask you that real quick. Why do you say it's Ari instead of Ari or vice versa? Uh, so I just, that's just because phonetically that's how it looks to me, but I know the Germans call it Ari, but then I guess it's my saying I need to say it a certain way is only, it's that weird thing where like you, you want to be taken seriously. So, and if you don't use the vernacular of the serious people, you'll be, judged oh look at this uh pedestrian says ari well so here's my logic my entire life i've said airy that's how i've always Mm. known it since i was a child um but the company you know do you know what airy stands for no okay so ar is the first part and then ri is the second part arnold and richter so ar is Uh. arnold and if you say r it's r re so by that logic, it should be Ari because it's short for Arnold, not Arnold. <laughs> but okay. uh, if the Germans say Ari, then that's what I'm going to say. Uh, I mean, a fair, but now, now I'm back on, on Ari train. If that's the, uh, <laughs> if that's the move. your plan there, but yeah, that's no, that's a, that's good to know. But yeah. cause I, you know, I would, I would, it's just like, yeah. it's the same thing as Leica. Everyone assumes that Leica is like the original company. Do you know the, the mashup there? Uh, lights, camera? Exactly. Yeah. The same concept. Arnold and Richter became Ari, or Harry, and lights is, or Leica is lights, camera. And now they've just gone back to lights. Well, the camera company is still Leica Camera AG. Uh, oh. But lights as as far as their cine lenses go yeah it's a separate it's like a sister company it's lights wetzlar Hmm. because that that is one thing like i this will just kind of kick us off into lens talk what is the uh there's like a lenses and then there's like a cinema lenses are they are they doing the thing that zeiss does where they sometimes will just take groupings from their photo lenses and put them in in their cinema lenses or are they not really different the only case that that happens is specifically with the M0.8 lenses, those little tiny Leica cine lenses where they just took their M lenses and put a different shell on the front or on the body. Um, but other than that, all of their, uh, I take that back. Some of the Talia primes are rehoused medium format lenses from their S line. So they're mm. from at S whatever camera. They repurposed some of those lenses, but they're, their proper cine stuff, like the lights, primes, the lights, zooms, Summicron C, Summilux C, those are completely different. 
Well, so actually that, that, that's a better starting point. So I think there can be, you know, I like the podcast to be as much for professionals as it is for people trying to learn. Cause I'm somewhere in the middle personally. Um, I think there's a lot of sort of maybe not misinformation, but misunderstanding about the difference between a stills lens, a, a rehoused lens, a, uh, a cine mod and what those means. Cause you know, there's these new, for instance, there's a lot of new cine zooms coming out or stuff like that. And people go, Oh, it's a proper cinema lens. Therefore I'm doing proper cinema. Yeah. And it's like, my my sigma 18 to 35 might look better than your like are you the only one using that lens because that's probably going to be more annoying than less um can you walk me through kind of the difference between those sort of three photo lens cinemod cinema lenses and why they're different not necessarily with the glass although i'm sure that's part of it sure in some cases um i think it would I think it's best to break it into four categories. You have a plain Jane photo lens. And then at the opposite end of that spectrum, you have a full blown from the ground up cine lens. And then in between those two, you have say a cine mod lens, which is a photo lens that has some add ons, mostly superficial, maybe a couple modifications. And then you have a rehoused lens where they take the original glass and maybe some of the original components, but you put it in a whole new housing. Um, I think it's important to separate those two because they're dramatically different results in the end. So what, um, in your mind, what are the primary differences between a photo lens and a cine lens? Uh, and how much of that is quality that you'll see <clears throat> quality that you'll see on screen and how much of that is usability? And uh, that's, you put it perfectly. It really breaks down to those two categories. Um, the optics, and then the usability, you, you nailed it perfectly. Um, uh, the optics being the actual optical design. And there is some difference between a photo lens and a cine lens as far as the actual glass goes. Um, or at least I should say more specifically the optomechanical design, which is how the glass is designed to function um, sort of in a marriage with the mechanical components. Uh, and then the usability is, yeah, the purely the mechanical how the lens rotates, you know, what moves, what sort of physical features it has. Um, so the optomechanical portion, lens engineers will take into consideration something like focus breathing or um, the parfocal design to keep your focus the same throughout the zoom. Most still lenses don't really need those features. So lens engineers will just sort of forget it or not bother dealing with it because it keeps the cost down. It makes it easier to manufacture, it makes them lighter, it makes them smaller. Um, but if you want to design those functions into the lens, you have to change how that glass operates with the mechanical design. Those sorts of things cannot be upgraded or changed after the fact. Um, I should say they could, but you're really redesigning the whole lens at that point. Um, it's kind of like, it's, it's like transplanting an engine into a car. You can't just pull it out and put it in another one. You'd have to do a lot of middle ground work and getting stuff to work with each other. Huge mess, not worth it for mm -hmm. certain aspects like focus breathing, like power focal design. Um, the other bits, the mechanical bits, that's usually pretty easy. That's where that rehousing comes in, where you can change things like the focus gears, the iris gears. You can change the, the front diameter of the lens. That stuff's relatively easy. Uh, those are, those are the big differences between the two designs. Well, and, uh, you, you rehoused, um, the, a couple lenses, right? The Tokina, I remember was a, a big one. Um, yeah, that was, was our, that's kind of the one that put us on the map. Most people know us from that because it was right around the time of the red one. Uh, actually there's more, we started doing it when the red one came out and then when the, the dragon bodies, the Epic and all that, um, it became really popular. Um, we don't do so many these days because it became so popular that other people caught on, foreign countries caught on, and they started producing them way cheaper than we could do here in the U.S. So we just said, never mind, we'll stick to service and sales. And it, it became very difficult to justify the price difference for us. 
Um, but yeah, the 11 to 16 was our first major rehousing as do close lenses. My father had been doing rehousings many, many years prior, um, doing it for Claremont camera, doing it for Kish optics, a uh, bunch of different stuff. Yeah. So I was going to say like the, the Tokina is like a good, um, case study, but I, I am actually interested because you and I, uh, off camera have never actually talked about this. Uh, tell, tell me about like the lineage from your dad to you. He's my father. There you go. <laughs> no, no, no. So my father started in this industry back in the seventies at Ingenue. Um, they used to have a branch here in the U S on the East coast in New Hampshire, which is where I was born. Um, they were a small office. They did a lot of service. Um, and he, once he got to a certain point there, his reputation became more well known. And Denny Claremont at Claremont camera offered him a job and we all moved out here to California and he had been there for years. Um, once he had sort of run that course, he ended up joining uh, a very small company called Kish Optics, who most people would know for their director's finder. If you've ever used a Kish director's finder, that's what my father built. That's what he helped design and build. That was their sort of their main product. They did a lot of other little things. Um, they had anamorphic products. They had uh, a smaller director's finder. They had lots of obscure things at the time. So he worked there for a while and that was kind of where I got my introduction. I would come in on summer breaks or on you know days off and tinker with stuff. And he would give me little assignments, you know, sort these screws or, Hey, clean these parts. Um, stuff that to me at the time wasn't interesting at all. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know why I was doing it, but that was my foundation. Um, once that had kind of run its course, he wanted to sort of go out on his own and start his own lens service business, um, which he had been doing. You can always do side work at a rental house. He had been doing it at Claremont. He did it at Kish Optics uh, and decided he had enough business to just start his own company. So we started to close lenses um, for, for a while. It was sort of part time, but then we got more and more business and um, it just never stopped from there. Yeah, because like it's always, you know, uh, definitely around the sort of and I will include myself in this group, the like nerd camp when it comes to cinematography, like do close lenses always pops up. Cause I think, uh, you know, you've, I don't know how to put this, but like, it's cool. It's cool to see. Like, I, I think of you as a tinker. Like I, I think of you as like Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory with lenses, you know, like, and that's, and that's cool. To, you've got two, what is that? Is that a curing machine or is that two resin printers behind you? There was two resin printers and an FDM and curing and, all that stuff. Yeah. I've only got the, uh, I've got a, I've got a just bombed out. Um, what's it called? The, uh, uh, I almost said do close goodness. Um, <laughs> the I three Mark two, who makes that? I three. I don't, uh, goodness. He's like the guy Prusa. Oh, I've got the, the Prusa, uh, FDM from 10 years ago and now they're way better. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I got to replace that. I, I just bought the magnetic bed that you can like peel off and just twist and all the parts come flying off. But like, it's going to take me 12 hours to install. <laughs> so I like got to find a day to do it. No, this one, was, um, I keep pointing the wrong direction. This one, our FDM one is just one of the Ender pros. Uh, and it just cranks stuff out. Anytime we need tooling jigs or, you know, a, a, a holder to a laser engrave something, just crank it out on there. And it's great. Yeah. Just, so what actually this, the space that I'm in, normally is our engineering space. It's dedicated. It's the office that I use specifically for engineering work. Um, my normal office I share with someone else that we couldn't, you know, during COVID we had to separate, we had to distance everyone. So I just sort of took up shop in here in the engineering space. And I've been here for over a year now. <laughs> just stuck, never left. They bring you, uh, food. you know, it's, yeah. I, I like it cause it is kind of like the nerd lab section of our office but there's no windows I can't see or hear anyone. It's a little closed off. <laughs> sure. What, uh, so what are you primarily using those printers for? I can't assume they're going into the lenses. No, never. We never ship any 3d printed parts. Um, actually I take that back. We've done, there's two parts that we've ever, two types of parts we've shipped. There's little, um, finger notches that are very 
ergonomic that we print for a like a reduction ring and to machine them would cost a fortune. So we ship those 3D printed. And then we've started doing some, what we call a split ring for focus gear upgrades. So on certain lenses that have a non-uniform focus ring, we print a sub ring that has like a gap um, just to sort of take up that space and then put our normal seamless CNC machine gear over that. Um, but primarily those are for prototype parts. Anything that we make, anything that we design and manufacture, we always 3D print first. Um, we've been 3D printing before it was a consumer option. All the stuff that back when it was rapid was, prototyping. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and we paid a fortune for it, but it was still cheaper than making an actual part out of aluminum or steel. Um, so we started doing that with like our carry handle products, the stuff that's it's a large piece of metal. And to machine that, not only to buy, you know, one piece of stock and then have all the tooling set up and the machining for one piece, it just wasn't economical. So we, we were 3D printing with companies around town. Um, you know, they had massive, massive machines and they would use the, the fused or the um, SLA, the laser sintering um, technique and the stuff was beautiful. But when these sort of machines came out, um, we thought, well, we don't really do anything bigger than that. So might as well do our own. Yeah. The, um, going back to the idea of the to we're going to jump around cause that's how I, uh, think, but <laughs> going back to the, uh, idea of the Tokina. So you took the, uh, 11 to 16. Why did you pick that lens specifically to put a bunch of work in to put into a new housing as opposed to whatever else was available at the time? So the original, I guess you could say the origin story of the 11 to 16. Um, this was probably, oh man, I should really know better dates. Um, well, like I said, it was right in that in-between period between red one and the epic bodies. Um, it's like 2009, 10, maybe. Yeah, that sounds right. Probably, probably 2009 ish. Yeah. Um, and we had a client that did a lot of sort of hybrid work. He was a photographer and a cinematographer. And he did a lot of stills work with the 11 to 16. And he really wanted to use it more for cinema work, but it had the electronic aperture. So you couldn't control it on a, on a red one. Um, and it was relatively simple. So he sort of hacked together. Um, a, a, a really, really simple prototype, basically just enough to get it onto the camera. Um, mm. And he brought it to us and said, hey, can you guys do this proper? And we said, okay, let's, we could probably do it. Maybe we could sell like 10 of them or something like that. So uh, we designed up some parts. We did, you know, a proper rehousing, basically pulled the sleeves off of it. Uh, most of the internal mechanics stayed the same with a few upgrades that we did later on to sort of stabilize the internals so there was no image shift. Um, and we even left that original band around the center that said Tokina because at that time it was sort of the, the, the onslaught of people rehousing stuff but not admitting what they had used. And we wanted to be mm. super clear that we weren't trying to hide anything like the badge says right there, this is a Tokina. We're not pretending that we came up with our own optical design. Um, so we did like 10 or 15 of them, something like that. Um, and we even on the inside, we gave each of them names that corresponded to letters in the alphabet because we never thought even at best case scenario, we'd never go beyond like 20 something mm. units. So we gave them clever names. Um, and they sold like hotcakes and we, we ended up making thousands of them, I'd, I'd guess. Um, maybe not that many technically because we had a break in at one point with one of our biggest batches and they took tons of unfinished uh, 11 to 16 rehoused lenses. Jesus. So that set us back a little bit. I don't remember how many that was or exactly when it was. Um, but that was sort of that whole evolution as it just started as this idea that one guy wanted and we kind of gauged interest and went from there. Um, and then after that, like I said, those other companies started doing very similar work, but for much, much cheaper and the quality showed, I mean, you really did get what you paid for. Um, and then after that, um, you know, with the quantity of lenses that we were buying, Tokina 
kind of took notice and thought, well, geez, if they're making this many of them, why don't we just do it? So Tokina introduced their version, the official Cine version of the 11 to 16, which I, it was kind of a kick in the face that they were going to sort of torpedo our business. But when they right. first released it, we had sort of a gentleman's agreement that they would only sell it in EF mount, EF and E mount. So if you still wanted the Duclos PL model, you had to go to Duclos or one of the other copycats. Hmm. So that sort of let us get all of our stock out and you know wrap up that whole project. And then they released the PL version. Because at the <clears throat> at the end of the day, I remember you said this when we did that um, uh, 50 versus 50 video. Uh, which you can see on the Duke Close YouTube. Mm. Um, Thank you again for that. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. Um, you said something that's always stuck with me, which is there's not there's no such thing as a bad lens. There's only the right lens for the right job. Yep. And um, I think people can get hung up in, is it a good lens or a bad lens, thinking about image quality. But at the same time, there there has to be lenses that just do not resolve well and like actually look bad. Uh, <laughs> but out there somewhere, yeah, of course there is. There's there's junk lenses out there, but there's also a project that is just waiting to be shot with that lens. There is a project well, that calls for that look, which means it's not a bad lens. It's the perfect lens for that project. Yeah, like something like the 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 Lomo lenses like the pet pet pets all that's all yeah terrible uh, design but people love it <laughs> yeah um how has camera design changing affected the way lenses are either perceived or now manufactured is there any correlation there um yes to some degree this is a bit of a a, a soapbox or rabbit hole topic um i think lens manufacturers sort of with the, the advent of the internet and keyboard warriors and everybody's a critic, um, you know, you pick your lens, any lens in the last hundred years that was made and you can Google it and some forum will come up with someone saying it's the worst lens ever. And then two posts later, it's the best lens ever. So everyone's a critic these days. Every new lens that comes out gets put through the ringer um, and everybody wants to know is it the best? Is it the sharpest lens they've ever made? So lens manufacturers over the last 20 some odd years have really sort of pushed that envelope of making the best lens they can. And the, the art of photography and cinematography has kind of taken a backseat as far as that engineering goes. And these engineers that are designing the lenses are focusing more on sheer image quality, sheer performance and kind of forgetting about the fact that these are being used to create art. Um, and because of that, you have lenses that are beautifully made, you know, really well designed, really high resolution, but they are kind of boring or they lack character. At a certain point, they end up all looking the same because they're all striving to be as perfect as possible. And when you're saying image quality, you mean like sharpness, not necessarily like goodness. Exactly. And that's the difference. Uh, goodness is very subjective. Sharpness and resolution and contrast are very objective. We give those for right. numbers on an MTF machine or we refer to the line pairs per millimeter for the resolution. Uh, but the other, everything else that you would want to know about a lens, the goodness part of it is completely up to the, the user, the person looking at that image. Well, and if, if uh, I feel like there's actually two analogous things. The first one being, um, you know, people like I know Sigma likes to make a, a very neutral lens. They say, yeah. um, very sharp, very beautiful. Like I, I've said, I love the 18 to 35, um, used it all the time. Cause it's for me, very flexible. I can go and make something for a client that just wants some, something very, very clean, or I can chuck filters on it and kind of make it a little, um, dirtier, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> I'm noticing way more people in over again, over, like you were saying over the past, maybe like 10 years leaning on black pro mist specifically. Cause someone somewhere at some point said the black pro mist was the thing. And then everyone got one to the point where some lens manufacturer should just install that right in the front of the group. Uh, <laughs> um, 
but that that race towards sharpness is then immediately pushed back to, by the race towards making things fudgy. Uh, yes and no. That has become very challenging for lens manufacturers uh, because the whole vintage lens craze has hit hard, and everyone's uh, you know vintage lenses prices are going through the roof. Whether it's a proper cine lens, a set of super speeds going for almost a hundred thousand dollars these days or a you know canon fds because people found out that that was sort of the basis of k35s fd prices are through the roof um the manufacturers kind of caught on to that and now they're trying to figure out instead of making the best lens possible should we try to back it up and make a more pleasing lens so you've seen that with manufacturers like cook doing their pancro classics or Canon doing the, the CNE Sumires, um, a handful of others. You've got Caldwell doing the, the Neo Super Baltars. Um, it's, it's definitely leaning that direction. But like I said, every all these armchair enthusiasts, uh, you know, keyboard warriors talking about the best lens and the, the overall quality and this and that. Canon, I'll use Canon as an example. If they put out a lens tomorrow for a still photo, you know, something that they mass produce and it's got loads of spherical aberration and the focus tapers off to the corners really quickly and maybe a little bit of geometrics distortion, all these qualities that make a lens vintage and have character, they would be destroyed online. The reviews would be terrible and nobody would buy it. So to convince these product planners and these salespeople to move ahead with a vintage inspired lens or a less than perfect lens is near impossible. Right. And then furthermore, convincing the engineers not to do what they've been trained to do and make a lens less than perfect is challenging. It's very difficult. I think a lot of people assume that these lens designers, these engineers that are actually coming up with the optical design, they assume that they're, they're, they're lens geeks uh, or they're photography enthusiasts. And more often than not, they're just a PhD. They're just a guy with a master's that knows physics and how light works through mediums such as glass. Uh, and they don't understand what it's being used for, the art of cinematography. So it's a challenge for them to understand why or where or how much to put a bit of character into an optical design. Right. And I, and I assume it's kind of hard to be like, cause I don't know when I think about it, I'm like, oh, I like the look of, you know, X film. Um, and, uh, so for instance, I like, I really liked the look of uh, son of monarchs. We interviewed, um, Alejandro Mejia about him shooting that it was a Sundance film and he shot Ari minis and the Lomo round fronts. So do I just decide everything I shoot is going to be on the Lomo round fronts, you know, that that takes away the artistic integrity, so to speak, that you're talking about, or does Lomo look at that and suddenly, you know, maybe everyone starts saying, Oh, the Lomo round funds. And they're like, well, we should really remake those completely. Go find the lens designs and go make those again. Cause we don't want them buying them used or renting them used. We want them to buy a whole new set. Um, is, is that kind of, you don't, you don't feel like that kind of discussion is happening. It's a much more engineering based and like, you know, price to performance ratio type stuff. That discussion happens often, I'm sure. Um, A lot of those vintage designs. So uh, another good example, most of the the engineers that made those older lenses, they're not around anymore. Uh, I I can almost guarantee if you go to, let's say I'm going to use Canon, for example, again, just because they're the 800 pound gorilla. Um, you go to Canon and you talk to one of their lens engineers and you say, oh, I, I love the look of those of these 1960, 1970 Lomos. And they would say, oh, OK. But they have no idea what lens you're talking about. They, right. They're not those kind of people. They don't understand that sort of heritage. They know what lenses they designed. They know the examples they were taught and engineering principles. Um, and, and the concept of physics they're applying to these designs, but you can't reference, you know, I, I want it. Can you guys make something that looks like a super speed? 
okay, well, what is a super speed? They don't know. <laughs> That's not the kind of work they do. So referencing these vintage designs, maybe they can tap into their own company's history. So let's say, for example, you say, hey, Canon, can you make those K35s? Nobody at Canon was, the, nobody at Canon right now was around when the K35s were produced. Everyone that was involved in that is gone. I can nearly guarantee that. So for them to dig back through their records, they don't even know where to start. It's probably not going to happen because they can't sell hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, and then the one of the biggest reasons is they they legally cannot use some of the materials that were required to make those lenses. They've been banned. Because they had like lead and shit in them, right? What's that? They had like lead and shit in them? Like yeah, all lead, of- arsenic, all sorts of stuff that is not allowed anymore. And Cook, so Cook is the, the exception to all of this because it's been the same company. A lot of the guys that work there have been there for a very long time. And Cook did just that. Everyone wanted the, the Pancros. Everyone loves classic Pancros. And Cook said, all right, well, we've got those original designs. We've, hell, they've even got some of the tooling from back then. Um, if you ever, I'm sure there's videos online, but their factory, actually, they just moved the factory, but the original factory, they've got some of the machines and some of the tooling jigs and polishing jigs from decades ago. It's very, very cool. Um, but they were able to take those designs, give them to their current optical designers and say, Hey, find the elements where we can't use those materials anymore. Find a replacement material that we can use that keeps the image as similar as possible. And let's go from there. And that's exactly what they did. They re-released the Pancros as the Pancro classic with modern materials, modern build quality, but the same basic optical design. So you get those similar results, but it took a small company like Cook, who is small time compared to someone like Canon or Sigma or Fujinon to do just that. Um, you know, when, when we look at lights, we've got the, uh, not the lens company, the lights, uh, eliminate, <laughs> um, you, you've got the, uh, uh, little, I just got finally after years of, um, needing one, especially for reviews and stuff. I got a color, color meter, you know? And so on it, I saw got that. the new, I saw that post that video. Yeah. I, I, uh, I'm very excited about it because <laughs> it's that one, it's just that one area of lighting that I had absolutely no ability to access. Like I never knew. I'm like, these look similar. Are they <laughs> like what? Close you know, enough. Why does, the, yeah. It cl- and I hate it. I hate close enough when you can just have, when you can know, you know, um, or like sun, like sunlight's the wild one, you know, like I, I measured in here, the sun was really pretty. I got a Northern facing window and it's like, if I want to replicate that, what do I have to do mechanically to do that? And I check and the, the sunlight coming in was like 4,300. Like if you just chucked a, a LED up there, put it at 5,600, first of all, is 5,600 coming out of there? No one knows. Nobody knows. And then, <laughs> and then secondly, that, that display. Yeah. And then uh, secondly, um, it wouldn't have been right. It would have been too, too cool. Yeah. Uh, this is all a roundabout way to, <laughs> to the Academy made the SSI, the spectral similarity index. I don't know if you're aware of that or if they just heard it in it. Basically it's like it compares the spec, the color spectrum of one light against another, and then gives you a score saying how close they are. So if you have like a tungsten light and you measure it and then you measure your led, it'll tell you how close it is. If that's what you want. Um, to the to the reference light Mm. is there something like that in lenses where you can say like oh you like the look of a master prime well the uh uh, lens similarity index says that a whatever sigma 50 art is nearly the same look that's a fantastic question yes and no i feel like that's sort of my response to everything you've asked Um, (laughs) that's fine hey man everything's in the nuance so i'll start by um sort of clarifying what you were referring to with the lights you can you could check that temperature right and it gives you let's say you have a super close number very minimal difference and from a practical perspective let's say one of them is um i don't know like a a quasar like a tube light you know and then the other Mm -hmm. one's like a light panel with bare leds 
sure, maybe those colors are similar, but you can't use those interchangeably because they're going to give you completely different results. There are different shape source. There are different, you know, one is diffused, one is bare LEDs, completely different results. Just because those numbers are the same doesn't mean they're interchangeable, right? Mm -hmm. We agree with that. Yes. So the same applies for checking lenses. You can put a lens on an MTF bench and it will spit out your modular transfer function number and lens A and lens B can be nearly identical across that graph. Um, but then you put them on a camera in an actual scene and you could still get very different results. So from that one perspective, looking at your micro contrast from an MTF bench, yes, you can get close to the same. You can get that one aspect nearly identical, but there's so many other things to consider with how a lens is perceived in the final image. Um, there is no, there's no all encompassing way to measure the look of a lens. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the look of a lens will always be subjective. Yeah. Well, and I suppose like the only way that two lenses can truly look similar in a way that I think people talk about this is if that war towards uh, ultimate image quality kind of came to a pin and all lenses kind of just looked the same by the fact that they had no character, no nothing. They were all optically quote unquote perfect. Yeah. And then it's boring. You, you could in theory sort of pick all of those different fields. So chromatic aberration, spherical aberration, contrast, resolution, all of these different factors that go into the quality and character of a lens. And you could give them all a value, but you'd really just be looking at a giant graph of what's where and trying to find what's closest. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no one all encompassing factor to consider with lenses. Sure. Which is really, I mean, that's the magic of them. They're not, they're not an A, B, they're not an on off digital medium. They're analog. They're, they're organic in a way. Um, they'll never be digital. Like, you know, cameras went from film to digital and lights went from incandescent to led. And it's all kind of become very, uh, very firm, Sterile. very defined, but lenses will always be subjective. Well, and that, that too, that's how you build a look, right? Like that's how you build a, a personal look, whatever you want. Like a brand is, is no one's going to like the lens camera color light package that you like right? in the same way. Whereas, you know, especially if, if we're all going to use Ari's, that takes a huge chunk of your creativity kind of out of the picture from that standpoint. Yeah. Whereas lenses, I think are still a place where you can, um, play around and, and shape a look and, and have fun. Yeah, no, um, I think that summarizes it perfectly. The, the lenses have become the paintbrush of an artist. Uh, you know, the camera is your, your kind of defined, I don't know, more power to Netflix, love them or hate them, but they've sort of become this standard of, is that camera Netflix compliant? because that's going to determine right. what your options are for a production. Uh, you're kind of stuck in these, um, in these, these grooves as far as camera choices go from time to time. Um, but with lenses, that's the artist's choice. Unless, uh, unless the production says you can only rent what this rental house has. Uh, but even then, you know, rental houses will just sub rent stuff. So the, the lenses right. I think have really become that tool of expression almost as much as filters. I think filters are equally important for cinematography. Totally. Is there looking back on, um, let's say the past five years, even five, 10 years of, of lenses and, and filmmaking, whatever, what are some of the sort of things that have excited you about the, uh, the technology moving forward? And what are the, some of the more frustrating things? Oh, the technology, or just lenses. I don't know how to phrase that exact question, but yeah. just lenses as, as you're in your career path. Yeah, because the technology itself hasn't changed much. There, we're all, like I said before, because there's still a 
um, an analog component of this whole puzzle, we're still bound by the laws of physics. And that hasn't changed in the past hundred years of lens, you know, photography lens manufacturing. So, um, I, not much has really, I, I guess what's say what has excited me most is seeing the resurgence of vintage lenses, even though it's kind of an opportunity for me to kick myself and not snatch up all the super speeds 20 years ago and I'd be rich now. Sure. Um, but seeing all these lenses get a second or third life uh, has been pretty awesome. Uh, not only because it's interesting to see it progress, but if I'm being completely honest, it's also afforded me and our entire company a very nice place in this business because these lenses need maintenance. They need to be cared for. Um, and with that care, they can work forever, uh, you know, two or three more careers. Um, the downside to it, I think, has been the... Well, it, it's a double-edged sword, I'd say, the downside. The, the downside has been how much people have seen the opportunity um, and just sort of jumped in to this business, not really knowing what they're doing. So maybe some of the rehousings that are very dishonest, um, you see people that, that see the price of a cine lens and they want to take advantage of that. So they'll they'll rehouse something and mark it up a ton and say, look what I've built. It's, you know, made in Germany. And that part has been pretty sad. But at the same time, you have other companies like some of these Chinese brands that have come in and really lowered the bar as far as the price to get into a cine lens. Uh, and seeing people be able to make that transition from a, a, a purpose-built photo lens to a purpose-built cine lens has been really satisfying because for the longest time, that debate that we sort of touched on earlier about what's the difference between a still lens and a cine lens, a lot of people have said, it's the same. You don't need a photo lens. You don't need a, a sorry, you don't need a cine lens. Use your Canon L series. Use your, the cheapest lens, your kit lens, whatever. You know, you could find all those videos on, on YouTube comparing a, a $400 lens to a Master Prime and you know, we, we did that video and I showed it. <laughs> we made that exact video. <laughs> but there's a ton of them that just show some still images or some videos saying, look, you don't need to spend 20 grand on a lens. Um, and I think the the manufacturers that are getting into the game now and producing really, really affordable lenses have sort of opened that door for people to try a cine lens and realize, oh, there is a difference here. I can get better results from a proper cine lens. Um, depending on the setup, obviously. Uh, but that has been that other side of that sword. So you have cool. the people that are jumping in to capitalize on margins and, and the fad. But at the same time, you have the people that are really just trying to get a product out that is really affordable. I think uh, especially like the the videos, I, I can think of one specifically, but I won't name them where they have <laughs> a handful of, yeah. we might be talking about the same one. Where Probably. It's just like, some dude dancing around and they're like, look, it's the same thing. Right. Right. And, uh, it's like, I suppose, yes, if your, if your work involves shooting in the midday sun for YouTube and you're alone, yep. then yes, that's it. You're right. They are relatively similar. Um, but if you're going to be working on set with an AC, no one's using a photo lens. <laughs> exactly. And that goes back to my, argument that I've had for years now that there is no bad lens. If I'm a one man band and I'm vlogging and I need to set up my little gorilla pod and point at me needs to focus, I'm not going to put a cine lens on there. I'm going to grab a, you know, a Sony master, whatever G master or a Canon L series, whatever that lens will work for that scenario. But like you just said, if you're shooting with a crew and you've got a focus puller and, you know, half a dozen or a dozen or more people's jobs are relying on you as a focus puller or a, a DP uh, and this production's costing thousands of dollars every minute. No, I'm not going to bring a, a Canon kit lens. I'm going to have the lens that I know is repeatable and accurate and it's going to get the job done no matter what. So that it just reinforces that there is no bad lens. There's just different lenses for different jobs. 
do you, there may not be a Badlands, but do you have a favorite? Oh man, I get that question every every. <laughs> I, I figured you would. Um, <laughs> I I could. It's like asking me to pick a favorite child. Um, mm-hmm. So as far as photography goes, so it, prior to being like I was explaining before with the rise of Duclos lenses, I had a small period in my career where I was a, fo- a still photographer. Um, I did a lot of editorial work um, that was all, you know, clean and accurate. Nobody wanted funky and different, but F8 I've always be there. What's that? F8 and be there. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, but I've kept up my photography as a hobbyist through my entire life. And as far as photo lenses go, um, the one that I've had on my camera, so primarily I shoot and I have many cameras. <clears throat> Currently, though, I switch primarily between a Fuji X Pro 2 and a Sigma FP. Uh, that Fuji X Pro 2 is like my go to travel camera. It's just because I've had it for so long. Um, and that camera, even though I own mm, most of the Fuji lenses that are available in X mount, um, it has had a piece of junk, Miticon 35 millimeter. It's actually not even Miticon. It's the, the Chinese version, Zhang Yi, uh, 35 millimeter 0.95. It's practically been glued to that camera for like four years now. Um, I would say that's probably my favorite lens for that setup. Uh, sure. On this, on the FP, which I'm kind of transitioning to because I like it more. It's full frame. It's faster. Everything about it's better. Um, I'm just waiting for the right lens to come out for that system. So I don't have a favorite there yet. Uh, as far as cinematography lenses go, uh, I don't know. I think that's a better metric though, because favorite is super subjective, but most used, like for me, the, the 18 to 35 was stuck on the C100, still is, literally has never come off. Um, on my C500, using a lot more of the Nikkor primes because full frame, you know, yeah. I can't really switch it over. I'm going to use it if I've got it. Um, on my X-T3, nine times out of 10, I've got the, uh, the, it's not a great quote unquote, not a great lens. The internet told me not to buy it, but the, uh, (laughs) the 35, the the 27 pancake. Okay. Yeah. Because I can just chuck that thing in my pocket. Exactly. 27 is, it's a great, uh, sort of all around, um, um, travel, uh, 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 focal length. You know, it's a two, eight focuses quick. Yep. Um, super light. And I just super light. And uh, really, really compact, you know, mad thin. So, like, that's that thing is nine times out of ten. I remember you suggesting the Miticon, and it's been on a list online that I've been <laughs> meaning to, like, keep buying. But, for yeah, for photo, I've just got that 27 um, pancake. When I do video, I'll actually – I actually put the uh, the Nikors back on it. Yeah. With a little okay. adapter. But that, that's um, another uh, – you nailed what I was trying to explain, you know, for the photo stuff, that's my favorite because it's it gives me the images the way it's it's become an extension. It's fully manual, so I can just snap my focus and I know where my hand is supposed to be. Um, I've just gotten so used to it; it works perfectly for that. And ninety percent of those photos are just my daughters running around. Um, so that's why it's my favorite, just the way I use it and the images that come out of it. For cinematography, if I was gonna pick a favorite, it would be my favorite to tear apart and clean and relube and put back together. Not my favorite for an image because I'm not a cinematographer. Uh, I, I, I tinker a lot with motion picture work, but my job does not rely on getting an image every time. So right. if I was to pick a favorite lens for cinematography, it's going to be the one that I like tearing apart. <laughs> well, that's a good uh, segue into uh, cause I did want to pimp this at some point you've been doing the, uh, weekly lens teardown live streams. Mm, yeah. Uh, talk, talk to the people about that. So that started, um, so everybody knows we're in this pandemic thing. Um, and here in LA, we had a mandatory shutdown back in, I don't even remember now, like 
May, I think, something like that. Yeah. Um, and we didn't consider ourselves an essential business at Do Close Lenses, so we shut down. Um, but we still wanted to keep the business running. So I would still come in random days, you know, try to get some of the work that was still here out the door. Um, and we, it was just me and my father were at basically opposite ends of the building. So we might as well have been at different buildings. Um, and if I'm being completely honest, it just got kind of lonely because normally there's 10 technicians, you know, within earshot and we all talk all day and chat and, Oh, Hey, look at this lens. Hey, look at this. Someone messed up this part. And, you know, we go back and forth all day and it got kind of boring, kind of lonely. Um, just sitting here working on lenses myself, you know, I'd run into a, a, a really obscure part like, Oh, Hey, look at, Oh, no one's here. Bummer. Mm. And so I thought, Hey, I'll just start live streaming because everyone else was doing it for other types of content. Um, and honestly it was just, you know, maybe a couple of my friends would watch or something, but uh, it kind of took off from there and people were more interested than I thought. Uh, and they'd tune in every Saturday and it'd be really interesting. I'd have people to talk to and I could share, you know, anecdotal stories on the lenses that I was working on or um, experiences and whatnot. But it was really just, uh, it started as a way for me just to share stuff with people. Um, and I couldn't do it with the lenses that we service because we have contracts with most manufacturers and we can't show that stuff. We can't broadcast the insides of a 24 to 90 Optimo. So uh, I just started doing it with the Cinemods because it's all vintage lenses and nobody cares about that anymore as far as proprietary information goes. And, um, and it's just worked really well. It's, it's, it gave me an opportunity to share all that with people and apparently people enjoy the geekery of it. I, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in there whenever I can be. <clears throat> when do you, when do you start normally Saturdays at what time? Saturday at 10 AM, 10 AM. It's not every um, Saturday. If there's, you know, for the, for a couple weeks, it was pretty regular. And then when things started getting a little bit less restricted, you know, my daughters had, uh, you know, zoom play dates or they had a virtual girl scout meeting or something. We'd have to do that instead. But most Saturdays I do it. Well, one, one thing that I, you know, it's hard to, uh, fit all of your knowledge into a one hour podcast, but I can say, um, if you go to any of these live streams that you've done, I, cause I've done this, you click any point and, and you're like in the middle of saying something fascinating, like whether it be a story or something specific about the, like just it's a three hour stream and it's just like, and there, and you're already, you know, you're learning. Well, that's what's um, so, so great about it is that the people watching have questions and right. if I have an answer, I'll share it. Um, and it's gone both ways. You know, people have shared some clever stuff with me, you know, some sources for used lenses to buy or, um, you know, different websites for movie enthusiasts and it's been pretty fun and i and i it, for the longest time i wasn't you know i watched the whole diy crowd um i've always been a very diy guy myself i've always been a supporter of like the right to repair sort of um absolutely movements and i thought you know legally when i started doing this i had to run it by the you know our, the rest of the people here and we were very nervous about, uh, you know, we didn't want to give tutorials, like here's how you do this lens, because that puts us in a, a liability position legally. So it was very challenging not to say, okay, now here's how you do this, but still give people knowledge, still encourage them to do stuff on their own. Um, and I think I found a nice balance, but I have to be careful not to put my company at risk. Sure. As far as, you know, someone watched my video and then they took apart their lens and it broke it. And now all of a sudden I, it's my fault. Because <laughs> yeah, you told them. Yeah. <laughs> quote yeah. unquote to do that. Uh, that's, that actually brings up a, a good question. What are, what are some of the things that get asked a lot and what, what is something that uh, you've learned from the people who've been in the chat? Uh, what get, gets asked a lot is what's my favorite lens. Uh, oh, okay. Sure. <laughs> No, people, and I hate being that guy. I think uh, I think the most common is people seeing 
the setup that I have and the tools that I have, which again, this is not my proper bench. Um, you know, where I'm sitting right now, what you're seeing is the same place I do the mod stream from. Um, and this was meant to just be an engineering office. So it didn't have you know, like our service area, the actual technician area is heavily filtered and it's got airlines run everywhere with heavily filtered airlines and a bunch of other stuff. I don't have any of that here because this is just an engineering space. Um, so people will ask what kind of tools I'm using, you know, where can I get those screwdrivers? Where can I get that? What is that chemical on your bench? Um, I did buy that slip mat. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> That's like the, one of the number one things. I see people reposting on Instagram, like, hey, I got my my setup. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's the mat that I recommended. Um, which is, again, part of that whole DIY thing. Yeah, you can go out and buy a, a technician service pad or whatever, but this $5 dog food ball mat works better. So <laughs> yeah. I share that those little things, those little tips, you know, the stuff that we've learned from doing this for I mean, me personally, almost 20 years, and then my father and some of our other technicians, our, our older technicians, I should say more experienced technicians, not older. Um, some of them have been doing this for 40 years. So we've all got these little tricks and stuff, and I'm usually happy to pass those on. Um, but yeah, that's the most common question is, you know, what is that? What did you do there? Why did you do that? Um, and then I think sprinkled in are the hey, I heard this is what to do with this, or I heard this, and I say, no, that's not right, or yeah, that's a good idea, depending on what it is. Um, and then people sharing stuff with me, like I mentioned a minute ago, I think I've been turned on to a couple websites, just like fan stuff. Um, there was one called Letterboxd. I literally just joined that last night. <laughs> I just set up my account when that guy, so one of the 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 people watching the mod stream told me about it because we were talking about all these different movies and what was shot with what. And, and I got onto the topic of, you know, I've got a, a mental list of movies that I need to watch. And he's like, Oh, you got to put it on letterbox so you can keep track of it. Um, so I've been trying to do that, but just it's a rabbit hole, man. I'll tell you. So dude, I'm not, that doesn't I'm not even kidding. It, I'm not sponsored. This is not a plug or anything. Uh, no, but it's basically just a, a mental, repository of what movies you've watched or what movies you want to watch and you can review them and you can rate them and stuff. Um, I don't, I'm not going to do that cause I'm not a film critic. Uh, but it's been super handy to like keep track of those movies that I want to watch to, regardless of the platform that it's on. Cause I still do that on Netflix and Amazon, all the platforms I'll add things to my list, but you can't see those lists in one place. So I've started using letterbox and it's been really cool. I, I'm not even kidding. I signed up for that last night because I've been during the pandemic shoring up my Blu-ray collection. And there's been a couple instances where I've bought the same Blu-ray twice because yep. I forgot I had it. I ha so I was like, man, go ahead. I was like, I just got to get this app. So I got the app and then I spent a good two hours last night going through like li just other lists, big lists that people had made or people that I had like followed because I connected it to my Twitter and just like going through and going like, yep, watch that. Yep, watch that. Yep, watch that. Because like, I think you're probably the same as me. We're like collecting things is fun. Yeah. Or like having things organized is fun. And uh, you're right. The app does have that thing where it's like, if you want to watch this, here are the services that it's on that you have, you know, or don't have if you select them. I'm trying now uh, to find how I can add people. I'm still new. I've only been using it for like three weeks or something. Yeah, I don't actually. I would use my phone, but it's in the teleprompter. What's I think because uh, mine is just what's your user or like now? Albot. Oh, we'll see if that comes up. Oh, all I found is this Kenny McMillan guy. Yeah, no, <laughs> sounds like a jerk. <laughs> wow, you said you just did it last night, but you ordered five hundred and seventy-six films, dude. I was <laughs> I was That's just hammering that. down on it. I told you it's a rabbit hole. All right, I followed you. Sick. Yeah, I'll add you when I. Uh, Get but this is what I mean. Like you can go to any page like, oh, yeah, the Matrix. I've seen that. You know, add it. It's, you just keep clicking them and it's 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 awesome. I had an yeah. app a long time ago. I stopped updating it, but I ran into the exact same problem you just said where I'd buy duplicate Blu-rays or DVDs. And it was a it was like a, a personal property organizing app. And I used to keep track of them in there. So when I was at Best Buy and I saw that bin of, you know, 399 movies, I'm like, oh, man, do I have this or not? So I'd go through the app, be like, oh, yeah, I already have it. 
Um, but now I'm using this because I kind of stopped buying discs. I do almost all digital now, unless it's like a, a special edition, you know, 4K. I'll, I'll get those, but for everything else, digital all the way. Yeah, I mostly buy movies that like either I like or because um, I mean, I'm, I'm a child of the uh, the special features era. Like that's where a lot of my film education came from mm. was watch. And that's actually what got me into making films. Honestly, was like watching special features and going like, oh, I want to do that. Like I would have been happy being a set photographer, you know, <laughs> like I was just I just wanted to be in that zone. Um, but there's something, you know, like. The, I loved the Phantom. You couldn't find that anywhere, and then two years ago it comes out on Blu-ray. That's on your. Was like, that's on your favorite films page, right? Where I, I know because no one, no one's ever heard of it. <laughs> I, I know I've heard of it. I've never seen it. So it's, prior, it's like a prior to my lens technician career. It's like I said earlier when I was, you know, when my father started, my father and I started Duke Lens in 2002. Prior to that, I worked at. It was this this fascinating concept where you'd go into a movie store and you'd rent movies for a, a predetermined amount of time as a place like physically yeah yeah hollywood video <laughs> that's wild it's <That> very wild <laughs> i worked at hollywood video for years so i've seen all of these movies just not like you know maybe i haven't watched them properly but yeah for the longest time you know it was every day i'd leave work and i have a stack of movies because they were free for employees um, and I just watched so much crap for years. I can't even remember half of it. See, that's my problem is I grew up on crap. And so uh, recently I've started. I, so I have like those Ikea cube shelves. Yep. Oh, yeah. And so I, <laughs> we all, we've all got those. Yep. And so I, uh, I've started doing a thing where, A, I've started a Criterion collection because I've pretty much seen no Criterion movies. Oh, you got to Which means that I'm a their streaming service. It's fantastic. Yeah, so like that's something I got. I started buying the actual Blu-rays because again, I'm a special features guy. I want to watch like documentaries about the films and all that. You know, we all take for granted. You have these classic film critics, you know, Siskel and Ebert, and and what's I forget who we got replaced by Roger or something. I don't remember. Roger, yeah, Roger, yeah, whatever. And Ebert. When I was a kid, it was Siskel and Ebert. Um, I remember him. And uh, you know, they're job seemed so easy they watch a movie and they give it a rating but their job is to give it an objective rating and we've come to this point in time where thanks to the internet again everybody's rating is their rating and people forget that just because you liked movie a doesn't mean i'm gonna like it and vice versa um and i think that people really need to remember that because you see it with lenses every day when someone posts on a forum or a Facebook group or, uh, you know, red user, anything. Uh, oh, I bought this lens and it, it's terrible. Don't buy it. And A, it's a vintage lens. You probably got a dud or it hasn't been cared for over the past 50 years. And B, that's your opinion. It's not a... Uh, a, a blanket statement for every copy of that lens ever made and what someone else might think is perfectly usable. So it really, people need to cool it. And I, I can't preach enough the, the right, you know, there is no bad lens, the right lens for the right job. It's the same as critiquing films. There's no bad films. There's just different films for different people. Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. Our theme song is written and performed by Mark Pelly, and the FNR Matbox logo was designed by Nate Truax of Truax Branding Company. You can read or watch the podcast you've just heard by going to ProVideoCoalition.com or YouTube.com slash Owlbot, respectively. And as always, thanks for listening.